o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means. It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Woohoo! And thank you, fake band. Thank you, fake audience. Say hello to the guys and gals in the chat room. There they are. Hello, everybody. Uh, hope you guys had a great weekend. Uh, I did. I went to a dog event with hundreds of cool dogs on Saturday and worked at home all day Sunday because nobody else was home and the house was quiet, so it was kind of awesome. Um, let's see who we've got. Uh, Adriana, uh, AJ Hal, 98, Amanda Ireland, uh, Anna Yarbrough, Audio Painter, Ava, I can't pronounce some of these, Ava Lamert, uh, Kano Beats, Kaz, Danny Weber, Dean Turner, Eric Spurl, Flowers, Ghost Artist, Gloria, Jesse, uh, let's see, Joey Hatcher, John Calvin, Lori Wynn, this one I can't pronounce, Jew Feel, uh, Pesavero. <laughs> anyway, I don't want to sit here and, and rattle them all off because it will take too long. But anyway, hi, thanks for showing up, you guys. Um, so today's show, uh, I'm going to be covering some stuff that I'm sure that I've covered in other episodes, but I go back sometimes and look at the chat after the show and realize there are a lot of people in the chat room that, you know, have not been around. They're new to Taxi TV. So I want to go back and reiterate stuff because people that watch the archive versions of the shows, that, you know, there's always new, there are always new people in the audience. So I definitely want to... Uh, cover that and you know as long as you're new you should be subscribing to the show and you should be liking the show so if you're watching the show on YouTube after the fact click subscribe click like and that way YouTube will love us and we will rise up and become grandiose and uh, then more people will watch us and spread the word and it's all very wonderful but now on to the big show so I'm going to talk about six things you need to know about if you're doing film and TV music and then I think I'm gonna have lots of time for some uh, Q&A at the end and I see we've got Scott Hansen in the chat room on tonight's taxi TV menu we're serving up our homemade vegetarian lasagna with our house salad homemade focaccia bread and a glass of Chianti free to all taxi members I'm telling you Scott someday I'm gonna get like 20 people to show up and we're all eating for free um, anyway good to have you here uh, also, you know what? The other day we sent out a thing just to show you how truthful I am. I sent out an email the other day uh, telling everybody that Amazon finally, after about a year, had put Robin Frederick's book, Shortcuts to Hit Songwriting, on sale, which they hadn't done in a very long time. And I said, you better get it now before the price goes up. And sure enough, uh, I think as of Saturday or Sunday, they raised it a little bit. It's still on sale, but it went up like $1.36 or something. So if you don't have this book and uh, you've heard great things about it, it doesn't have uh, like 4.75 stars for nothing, you know. Buy this book. And I am the publisher. Wow, this this is changing my coloration. Very, very weird. Um Anyway, I am the publisher of this book, so I do make a couple bucks if you buy it, but uh, this is the only songwriting book that I'm aware of where you can buy it, and if you don't love it, send it back in resellable form, and I will refund your money. That's how much I believe in this book. So there you go. There's that. And I'm going to crack this baby open right now. Rockstar. Got to love the Rockstar. This flavor, the jury's still out. This is... Uh, Rockstar Pure Zero Lemonade, Fizzy Lemonade. Not bad, a little bit tart. Um, okay. Uh, let's see, I covered that already. Okay, question number one. How much money can I make from film and TV music licensing? People ask me this in a very general way all the time. Um, a lot of my friends that I kind of grew up in the industry with uh, that I haven't spoken to in a zillion years, 
uh, will call me up and go, yo, so I see that you guys do a lot of film and TV stuff over there at Taxi. How much money can I make from that? <laughs> of course, there is no simple answer to that question. Of course there's no simple answer because that would just make things way too easy. Um, I had to change my shirt right before the show. I had on a shirt with some stripes in it, and they were uh, doing moraying. They were moving all over. So I put on my spare taxi TV shirt. Shouldn't they make buttons about right there? Because if you button this one, it's too high. If you unbutton this one, you get the hairy chest syndrome. <laughs> Anyway, how much money can I make from film and TV music licensing? Well, that all depends, of course, on how much time and effort you want to put into it. I mean, it's like saying, uh, like Scott Hansen, how much money can I make from a, uh, a, you know, a pizza shop, an Italian restaurant? Well, it depends. Does it have 12 tables? Does it have 50 tables? Do you have one? Do you have 10 restaurants? Um, you know, do you charge uh, six bucks for a piece of lasagna or do you charge $11? So there's so many variables, but, uh, you know, look, we've got taxi members who make no money yet, yet, and I underline the yet. We've got tons of members, I mean, probably countless members that make a little bit of money, you know, a couple hundred, a few hundred a year um, that are just kind of like in year number one of their arc. Remember the five-year plan? Uh, I had Matt Hurd on the show about three weeks ago. We talked about the infamous five-year plan, which basically means that in year number one, you'll probably make nothing, maybe table scraps. Year number two, a little bit better table scraps, a few hundred bucks. Year number three, you know, if you're working on it, a um, thousand, two thousand, three thousand, maybe by some stretch of the imagination, five or ten grand, maybe. Um, and I'll explain some of those variables that determine that. Um, year number four, um, I know people that are working hard at it that in year number four have made, let me do some quick math, you know, maybe like 10 to 15, maybe even 20 grand in some exceptional cases in a year. Um, and then year number five is, seems to be the pivotal year. And that's where the five year plan came from, where people kind of get some, uh, what's the word that I used? Um, Oh, shoot. I had it in. Not centrifugal force. Uh, anyway, you get to a point where things start to snowball. Um, and uh, so, look, we've got people that are making close to 200 grand a year. Maybe people that are making more than that, and I just don't know them personally. But year five seems to be kind of the tipping point because if you've been in it for five years and you participate in Taxi TV, you participate in the Taxi Forum at forums with an S, forums.taxi.com. You go to the Taxi Road Rally. You do all the right things, generally speaking, and I can't guarantee this, but it works for a lot of people. In the fifth year is when you start to see things take off. Um, I had Matt uh, Vanderbo here last week uh, and, and Chuck Henry, two awesome guys. Uh, I consider them both friends. Chuck has been with Taxi for, I don't know, more than 10 years, some, probably somewhere around 15 years or more. And he makes a really nice, enviable living by almost anybody's standard. Uh, he makes good money. Um, Matt Vanderbo uh, made enough money. Oh, check this out. It's in black and white because I just printed off a laser printer, but our very own Matthew Vanderbo from Boise, Idaho, who works in <laughs> that little tool shed. That's his studio in a tool shed. <laughs> That's the inside of his studio that has practically no equipment. He's got like two or three microphones, a pair of monitors, um, a two octave keyboard it looks like and a bath mat on a table in that little tool shed he is the star of our next taxi print ad I quit my day job because I make more money from my music and that my friends is a true story so he's a great example um, I think he's probably been a member for seven ish years somewhere around there and he's now making enough money that he was able to walk away from his job as a college professor at Boise State 
and is now doing music full time sitting in his backyard in the tool shed. Hopefully the gardener doesn't bring the the um, the what do they call the the riding mower in and run, run mad over while he's mixing something. But uh, so it depends. There is no set amount of money that you can make from film and TV music licensing. There are all kinds of variables. How often do you do it? How many days a week do you do it? Um, do you have a full-time job and you can just do it like you know a couple hours a night, three or four nights a week? Um, are you willing to give up your Saturdays and Sundays and not go fishing or skiing or picnicking or whatever you do to lock yourself in a tool shed with that Vanderbilt and make music for eight hours? These are the sacrifices, but you know what? Time and time again, I've seen the people that make those sacrifices and choose that lifestyle and choose that path um, that do walk away from their day jobs. And, and frankly, they're setting themselves up for a pretty awesome retirement. I really, truly, with all my heart, believe that you can set up an awesome retirement fund for yourself with nothing more than your music and it, you know I'm certainly not a financial advisor by any stretch of the imagination so don't consider this advice from a financial advisor because boy would you be wrong if you did that but you know you can invest in the stock market you could get an annuity you could do bonds you can do all that stuff which professionals would tell you you know have a balanced portfolio but your music is something that is like the gift that keeps on giving because it's cumulative. In the, in the first year, you may get five or 10 or 15 things you know, out there. Uh, year number two, maybe 15, 20, 30 things signed to different publishers, different music, production music libraries. Year number three, maybe you get up to 60 or 70. Year number four, 100. I know people, um, I think, I want to say that Matt Vanderbilt's got more than a thousand tracks out there now. Anyway, it becomes cumulative. It's not like you get them into a library, they're there for a year, and they, they fall off the map. Hopefully you're making music that is somewhat evergreen, that continues to be viable for a period of time, ongoing years, maybe for a long time. And it just keeps adding up. So the more music you get in the more places over more years, it becomes very foundational, um, something that you can build a real income with and an income for the future. So uh, the more often you do it, the better you become at it. The better you become at it, the more prolific you become. So it, it's um, self something. There's a word for that. You know, it, you just become better at doing anything you do all the time. Uh, you become more efficient and the music will get better and you will be able to do it more quickly. What might take you, you know, maybe it takes you a week of hour or two at a time to do a single instrumental cue now. Hopefully in a few years it'll be at the point where you can do it in three or four hours for the same thing. Just because you've gotten that much more familiar with your equipment, that much more familiar with the genres that you're working in, and you just get better. So um, I'm not just talking about making better music though talking about making music that's more usable because it would be a crying shame to be cranking out a bunch of music that nobody's interested in. So you do want to focus your energies on making music that is what the industry actually wants and needs because otherwise you're making music, it's almost an exercise. And if you look, if you're doing it because you just love making music and that's your goal, that's great. But if you're doing film and TV music because you want it to be a commercially viable business and you want to make music that the industry is actually going to sign and use, then you have to pay attention. And there, there are some rules. They're not really hard rules but uh, or difficult rules, but there are some rules and some conventions that you should follow. Um, Let's talk about the difference between doing instrumental cues and songs. Um, you could have the greatest song in the world. You could write, you know, like a, a song that would be a number one hit on the charts. 
But as great as it might be, it might not be right for film and television because the lyric content may be very specific or about something that's not going to work in a lot of scenes in TV shows or movies. So while it could be great, it might not be right. I'd rather have something that is not quite as great, but is right in that um, it's something that would support a lot of emotions and a lot of moods in a lot of different movies. Therefore, it's more usable and can get used more frequently. And the more often it gets used, the more money it makes. And probably the longer lifespan that it will have as well. Um, same thing is true of uh, instrumental music. You know, it's, again, you could be the next Beethoven, but it doesn't really matter if Beethoven is, is composing music that the industry doesn't need. You might be better off not being Beethoven and doing, uh, I think I may have seen Bob Meddy, I think I saw him in, in the chat room. Um, this is a gentleman who has done a lot of jazz piano stuff, a lot of cocktail jazz, a lot of jazz generally speaking. And not that that's all that he does, but that's a special talent of Bob's. And he's gotten some incredibly good placements uh, with nothing more than a, a solo acoustic piano piece that just happens to set a mood. I, I always want to say that he's got one piece that's in a, a perfume commercial, um, has been in a couple of times now. I want to say Estee Lauder, but I think I'm wrong about the brand. Donna Karen. Uh, Donna Karen, he, he's got a piece that's been licensed twice, I believe, for Donna Karen TV commercials and probably in store use as well, um, along with that, that scent. So, you know, it, it's about being right, having the right thing more than it is about creating something that sounds like John Williams scored it and that you recorded it with the London Symphony. Um, moving on. Oh, still on that subject. One of our members wrote in, uh, Bria from the staff came down here and handed me a note. Actually, I, I think I, I threw it in the garbage. But before I did, uh, here, I'm just going to read what this gentleman wrote. As part of answering this question, how much money can I make from film and TV music licensing? Is it possible to give us some slightly more granular real-world examples on royalty payments for different type of shows? For example... A one-off placement in a local sports network TV show versus a one-off placement in an internationally syndicated HBO drama series. Um, the big dream for a lot of us composers is to get a placement in something big. And he put big in quotes, so really big. Um, that would actually pay. Honestly, my own personal way that I would approach that wouldn't be to go for the lottery, you know, go for the big payoff, but kind of like investing in stocks and bonds or any other financial instruments it would be to um, kind of spread your bets and make lots of little bets, um, kind of like building a portfolio of many stocks versus just rolling the dice on one. Again, not giving out financial advice because I'm certainly not qualified to do that, but um, yeah, there there are TV commercials where you can get a check for you know twenty five grand, fifty grand, seventy five grand. There are rare occasions still where you can get a check for a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars for getting your music in a TV commercial. The odds of that happening are not nearly as good as getting something in. And let's address this gentleman's question. I guess I should pull it back out of the garbage again and turn it right side up. Um, so let's talk about uh, a local TV sports network show, getting a placement. Okay, so there's so much to talk about. People have written entire books on this subject, so I don't think I can cover it in this episode. Yeah, I've got some time. Here you go. Okay, you can get a little instrumental cue placed in a sports TV show that would be on a local network. Um, let's say you're in Chicago and you get something on the, you know, the Cubs are playing a game and you have a piece of music that ends up um, being broadcast only in Chicago for that Cubs game. So number one, it's instrumental. 
Um, so that makes you less money than a song would. Um, number two, is it background or is it featured? Um, how long is the use for? If it's over X amount of seconds, it pays more than if it's under X amount of seconds. But in particular, sports TV often doesn't pay a lot because it is localized or regionalized. Uh, it could be for Fox Sports West, which is just the West Coast. Um, then again, you could have something on, you know, CBS Sports during the basketball finals. I don't even know where the basket, what network they're on these days, but that could go national and that would pay differently. So there are all these different things that go into the stew that makes up what you get paid. So while it's tempting and really alluring to think that you could get something in, let's say, Homeland on HBO, guess what? Cable doesn't pay as much as broadcast network television during prime time. So let's say there's a show like 24 that was on Fox, uh, which is a major broadcast network. And I'm not talking about Fox News, I'm talking about Fox, Fox, the, the regular TV network. So if you had a piece of music that was in um, 24 on Fox on Sunday night at nine o'clock, that would be considered a, uh, a broadcast network placement, prime time, and it would repeat um, at least once more when the season repeats. Anyway, that's, that's a big money maker. That's a prime placement. The sync fee that you get for that would typically be in the like 1,500 to 5,000 range, probably more like 2,500 to 3,500 bucks. Again, a lot depends on is it featured? Is it background? Is it background source? Uh, does it have a vocal in it? If it's a song, yes, it does. Um, it could be that somebody in the cast is actually singing the song. That jacks it way up. So there are all these things that determine how much that piece of music makes in that circumstance. Um, then again, um, Guys like Chuck Henry, who was on the show last week, uh, has a ton of instrumental music. Primarily his thing is instrumental music, maybe almost entirely instrumental music. And Chuck has stuff that gets in shows on VH1 and MTV, um, TV series that, like, uh, I'm trying to think of a good one, like Road Rules or something like that, um, that ends up getting syndicated all over the world. And while you might think that the HBO thing is your ticket to global, you know, uh, broad, getting broadcast on a global basis, um, MTV, <laughs> I know a lot of taxi members, or I should say I know several or maybe many taxi members that have made quite a bit of money getting what I like to affectionately call stupid little instrumental cues in reality TV shows that appear on MTV and VH1. And because those shows on MTV and VH1 are broadcast in countries all over the world, and very frequently in other languages all over the world, but they tend to keep the music in there, you can make really good money. It will take a long time for that money to come back to you from all over the world because it's got to go from the PRO, Performing Rights Organization in Italy, let's say, or France or wherever. It first gets goes from the cue sheet where it's reported by probably an intern that works on, on um, the network over there. Uh, so the cue sheet is where it gets reported. It goes to the PRO. Let's say it's in France, so it goes to an organization called SOSEM. I believe that's how you say it. Um, and then SOSEM has agreements with ASCAP and BMI in America, and the money goes from France to America and eventually gets to you. And it might take a year and a half or more before you get paid. And then maybe in the next pay cycle, in the next quarter, um, three months later, you'll get paid again on that. So don't automatically assume that getting your song in the montage at the end of Grey's Anatomy, um, it, it may and 
probably could or will make you more money than an instrumental thing. But then again, you know what? Uh, Chuck, uh, Chuck Henry, Matt Hurt, several of those guys that have been very successful at, at doing this for a long period of time now have told me, uh, shown me examples where they've had a single instrumental cue that maybe made them eight or nine thousand dollars over a period of time just from being, you know, 14 seconds here, 27 seconds there, a minute and a half here. So there is no way to say this is what you should do and this is how much it's going to pay. That's a very long-winded answer to this gentleman's question about can you give me, he wants a range. He wants, you know, you're going to make $27 on this and you're going to make 500 on that or 5000 on that. It's so complex and so contingent on all these variables that it's really, really hard to say to give you any actual numbers. But I will go back to what I said originally, which is you want a lot of stuff out there in a lot of places, and ultimately that will result in a lot of placements. And it's a penny business, but those pennies add up. And you want to build a foundation that is wide, deep, and strong. And over time, it just keeps getting better and better. It hits critical mass and seems to take off around year number five. But that's certainly no guarantee because who knows what you're doing for the first four years or so. Some people do it, you know, two hours a week. Some people do it two hours a night. Some people do it 20 hours a week. It depends how much time and effort you're putting into it. It's contingent on you doing the right kind of music that there's a, a market for. Some kinds of music have a much higher demand than other kinds. So, like I said, variables. All right. So now this is going in the garbage and I'm not pulling it back out again. But I am going to have another sip of that rock star. Mm -mm, good. Um, okay. Oh, by the way, I've never met anybody who can understand the magic formulas that the performing rights organizations use to calculate how much your music is going to make you if it goes out to wherever. The formula is just impossibly hard to understand, even if you're a freaking math major. Um, it's definitely not one size fits all. That much I am sure of. So the next question that I get asked all the time is how long will it take me to become successful? Well, again, that depends on how much time you put into it. Do you do two hours a day? Do you do two hours a week? You don't need to be a math major or a rocket scientist to figure out the more time you spend doing it, the more quickly you're going to become successful. And besides, what defines successful? For some people, it's like a red letter day in their life. It is a major event for them to get something in any sort of TV show. Any kind of music of any length in any kind of show, the fact that they can say, check off that box that says, I have accomplished that life goal of getting a piece of music in a TV show, that's a form of payment and a type of success that is magical. Um, for other people, it might be, you know, like Matt Vanderbilt wanted to replace his, his income from being a college professor, and he did it after, I think, about five years, six years, something like that. So that's a different kind of success. So it depends how you define success um, and how fruitful your efforts are. I know people that can get more work done in two hours than other people that probably accomplish the same thing in a period of 10 hours. It depends how many rock stars you've had. It depends how focused you are. It depends um, how good you are and comfortable you are with your home studio. Uh, it depends on um, how elaborate your productions are and the, the pieces that you're doing. If you're doing songs and you've got to write lyrics, that adds a huge amount of time to each piece of music that you're cranking out, just getting the lyrics right then finding the right vocalist and then recording the vocal and then recording the background vocals. That just adds so much time to production that personally, if I were doing it, mostly what I would be doing, maybe not entirely, but mostly would be instrumental stuff just because you can get more of it done in a shorter period of time. So that is, you know, kind of goes to the question of how fruitful you are and how fruitful you are goes to the question of how long will it take me to become successful? 
So I know people that say, I've been in the music business for 30 years. What the hell does that really mean? I've been in the music business for 30 years. Well, okay, you play guitar and you hang out with some other musicians and you talk about the music business, but have you actually been in the music business? You've kind of been on, on the fringe of the music business. Um, so, you know, thinking about it, talking about it, um, having an opinion about it, all those things aren't don't qualify you for really being in the music business as much as somebody who is actually making music that is viable in the marketplace, has a commercial um, viability, that somebody would be willing to pay for what you're doing. So that goes to the level of success as well. You know, somebody who's crossed over that line and gotten to the point where they're good enough, where they can sit down with a goal and a target in mind and say, I'm going to do hip hop instrumental tracks today or a hip hop instrumental track today. And by the end of the day, they've got one. That's a level of success versus somebody that's sitting there thinking, gee, I wonder, you know, should I do hip hop instrumental? Um, that's not, that's not success. And then they grouse about they're not successful. Person A sat down, actually did it. Maybe didn't do it well the first five times, ten times, twenty times, but they did it. That is some modicum of success. Um, I made a note. I think I've said this already. The rule of thumb for people who are working fairly hard at it during their spare time uh, is the first year no money, second year a few hundred bucks, third year few thousand bucks maybe fourth year maybe more thousands of dollars and I'm talking you know like a thousand two thousand three thousand not twenty thousand fifty thousand a hundred thousand um, and around year five it starts to kick in if you've got several hundred pieces out there in the marketplace you can start uh, to see things hit critical mass so I'm just repeating myself but it's worth repeating uh, if you're doing songs versus instrumentals, you might earn more, I uh, talked about that, earn more money from sync fees but your output will be much less um, oh, are you studying the most requested genres? You'll probably make uh, become more successful more quickly if you're making music in those genres. So are you good at delivering cues in typical instrumental cue form? Again, you could be making cues, but if you don't know how to make cues in the right way, in a usable, productive, commercially viable way, Yes, you're making cues. Yes, you've achieved some modicum of success in that you have finished those instrumental cues, but it's kind of fruitless to make them if your cues, let's say, are six minutes long and they meander and they have no structure and, and they don't build from, you know, and have like a beginning, a middle, and an end. So, yes, you're making music, but you're not making music the right way. And frankly, I think it's probably just as easy, if not easier, to make music the right way. Um, are you doing uh, solo piano cues? Are you doing big orchestral stuff? Um, makes a huge amount of difference. I mean, the orchestral stuff, the amount of time you have to invest in getting just the strings, no matter which library you use. But let's assume that you're using a pretty darn good string library. It's modern, it's state-of-the-art, you still have to know how to articulate those strings and which strings should be playing in which octaves for, you know, some string libraries might sound better doing legato stuff. Um, some might sound better for pizzicato stuff. Um, the violas from this library may sound really good, but it's the violins from that library that really work on the top end even better. And then there's the cello sound of library, you know, the third library that's the really kick-ass cello sound. Well, somebody who really knows what they're doing and is investing a lot of time in learning their craft really well knows that they should use violins from library A, violas from library B, cellos from library C if they're doing big you know, John Williams orchestral stuff. But if they're doing pitsies, you know, um, maybe it's Library D. So all these things go into the stew of are you successful and you have to decide what success means for you because it's individual. Um, are you collaborating? Um, 
because while it may take you a little bit of time to figure out a comfortable workflow for collaborating and it may take you a little time to meet the right collaborators that work well with you in the genres you want to work in and at the speed that you're comfortable working at and that they deliver when they're supposed to and that you hold up your end of the bargain and deliver reciprocally is that the right word? <laughs> you reciprocate by getting stuff back to them in a timely fashion. That all takes, you know, it doesn't just happen in an instant most of the time. But once you figure that out and get that workflow and become productive, all of a sudden, boom, things start to happen kind of magically. Um, next question. How much does my age matter when pitching film and TV music? I get this question a lot, and it's funny. This is one of those questions where people don't generally ask it, like on a panel at, at the Taxi Road Rally. They will ask me privately in an email, or if I meet them personally, you know, it's like, you know, can you do this as an old guy because I'm in my 60s? And the answer is absolutely you can. The record industry, age is a currency. You know, um, I used to make jokes frequently about uh, record labels wanting to sign people while they were still in utero. Um, it, it seemed like record labels couldn't find people young enough fast enough and that you had to be young and pretty or handsome and really cool. All that went into that stew, you know, of making a viable artist. And it's not because they're ageist really and they have something against older people. It's because the people listening to pop music are generally pretty young. So they kind of want to assign people that are going to have an appeal to the audience. And I get that. Um, doesn't mean that somebody older couldn't make that same music. Another reason, by the way, that record labels don't like to sign people in their 40s or 50s is career lifespan. If they sign somebody who's 48 years old who may be amazingly talented, really, really, truly a genius level, making music that is just commercial as can be. But if you're 48 years old when you get signed, the record doesn't come out till you're 50, you don't have a lot of years left to tour because you're not going to have the, the ability to endure the rigors of touring at 50 or 60 years old like you would at 20, 25, 30 or 35 years old. So yes, the Rolling Stones and some legacy acts, Aerosmith, you know, uh, have band members that should probably not be touring, but they still do and they pull it off really, really well. But you know what? They've built a fan base over decades, number one. Number two, they've got a, an infrastructure. You know, e each member of the Rolling Stones has their own personal chef that travels with them, probably an oxygen tank that travels with them, and a bunch of other stuff that a new artist starting out wouldn't have. So it's not really apples and apples, it's apples and oranges. But getting back to the question at hand, uh, does age matter for film and TV stuff? Not really. Um, because most of the time, the people making music for film and TV are anonymous. We generally don't know unless it's a big act and a big song that gets licensed for a big feature film. You might go, oh, that's you know a song by whatever artist. Um, but... Certainly, you know, in reality TV shows um, for background source cues in shows, um, you know, primetime networks or broadcast networks or HBO or any of the big cable outlets. Um, most of the time, the, the people making the music just aren't known. They are anonymous most of the time, not 100 percent. So age doesn't matter. Uh, one way that age does come into play is if you are dating yourself by not staying current. So if you are in your 60s and you're making music that sounds like uh, the happening thing when you were in your 20s, that's that the age is coming in, into play there. But technically, it, it shouldn't. You know, as long as you're staying current and fresh and on the the cutting edge of what's current and fresh and contemporary, your age really doesn't matter. Um, flip the page here. I want you to know that I am ad-libbing the last the answer to the last three questions for the show because somebody who I adore stopped in the office today and came into my office and we ended up talking for a good half an hour so it prevented me from writing down my thoughts. So I'm going to work without a net for the last half of the show. Um, 
something that it's a bit of a recent phenomenon, uh, a bit, is that sometimes shows do want to get, especially when they're looking for songs. I don't think instrumental music uh, really uh, causes this. Or this doesn't happen a lot for people creating instrumental music, but for songs, sometimes they want artists that, are, even if they're not like a big hit artist, artists that are on the bubble, that are starting to build uh, a reputation or a fan base out there via uh, music blogs or the internet, you know, in, in the broader sense. They do like having that are an artist, a, a band. Um, uh, why? Because they bring a few fans with them, number one, but the, it's almost like a cachet thing. Uh, you know, it's like cooler to say you've got this band in your show. Um, I personally think that ultimately, if you had a really cool band with a piece of music that was a 9.3 on a scale of 10, and an unknown entity that wasn't a band or a, you know some really cool artist and the piece of music from that person was a 9.7 i think that ultimately they will choose the right piece of music and that they won't say yeah this is actually better in the scene but i'm going to go with this because it's a band that's got a following on music blogs i could be wrong but i don't think that i'm that wrong about that um Sometimes in TV commercials, they want somebody who is a band or an artist that's got a following um, because the people at the ad agency that pick the music are hipsters. Or maybe the people who are involved in the, uh, you know, from the product side, uh, let, let's say Budweiser. Let's say Budweiser is working with XYZ ad agency. Well, it could be that the VP of advertising at Budweiser um, really likes a particular band and maybe for that reason they want a band who is a bit of a brand because the people that like that band also happen to fit the demographic of Budweiser drinkers so there's a lot that goes into that little calculation about whether or not they use a piece of music from a known entity a known band or somebody anonymous but I would put my bets personally on it more often than not they will pick the music that is works best in the context of the commercial or the scene in the TV show or the scene in the feature film. Um, the music that works best with picture is the music that gets picked. Um, it's that simple. Are there politics involved? Maybe sometimes. Um, yeah, it, it happens. Um, but I think that a lot of people uh, want to say, oh, you know, you can only get your stuff in XYZ show or that person got their music in that big advertisement because they were connected and there was some political part of the calculation. It happens. I won't say that it doesn't happen, but in the end, more often than not, I believe that the music that gets used is used because it is best with picture. Um, how am I doing on time? Halfway. Still got some time. Um, ain't uh, Mojo Bone says, ain't singing for Pepsi, ain't singing for Coke. I know a lot of people who actually sang while doing Coke. <laughs> and, and I'm not talking about the kind that comes out of this sort of container. I'm starting to like that Rockstar lemonade with bubbles in it. Uh, okay. So moving on to question number four, what can I do to create a long-term career doing this? Pretty much everything that I've talked about since I started today's show. You want to have a goal in mind. You want, once you know what the goal is, it's easier to define what the pathway to the goal is. And I would say that it's all about consistency, um, persistency, and, um, being a professional. If you, you know, you guys have heard me say this a million times. Excuse me, there's this week's Rockstar Burp <laughs> brought to you by Rockstar Energy Drinks. Um, if you treat it like a business, it's going to pay you like a business. If you treat it like a hobby, it's going to pay you like a hobby. You can't invest a hobby's worth of energy into something and expect it to pay you like a business. 
it's not going to happen. Um, so what can you do, do to build a long-term career is keep doing it all the time because anything you do all the time you get better at. And as you get better at it, you will start to make better music and you will make more of it more quickly. And when you do that, you will start to lay that foundation that I was talking about that's deep, wide, and and broad. <laughs> Is that a dimension? <laughs> um, and over time, it becomes cumulative and that's how you build a long-term career. It, it's just that simple. Um, yeah, It's not like athletics, sports, where... Um, you know, uh, basically uh, professional athletes have an arc and they get to a pinnacle and they become big, famous and wealthy and they're at the peak of their everything and then it falls off because they get older. That really doesn't happen in the music industry is because you're the only thing that will make that happen is if you don't stay current. And the only person you can really blame for that is you because it's easy to stay current because all you have to do is look and see what's going on out there in the world and keep retraining yourself to, you know, um, drum, the styles, the fashions change, drum parts change. If you go back and listen to music from the 70s, you'll hear a lot of drum fills are like taka 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 taka. Uh, they're different now. A lot of songs don't even have drum fills in them anymore. But when you hear a song that does have drum fills in it, and if they're like 70s or 80s style drum fills, you've largely taken your music out of contention for the broader market because it sounds dated. Well, the same thing is true for bass parts. The same thing is true for synthesizer sounds and um, chord inversions. We've talked about that on the show recently. You know, just a, a regular old triad uh, might be great for some things, but you may want to, you know, lift a finger and not play one of those notes in the chord. Or maybe you want to, you know, do a ninth on something that normally wouldn't have it. Or you want to strum backwards so that uh, you're not strumming down on a chord, but strumming up on it. It just sounds different. You may want to use open tunings. You may want to capo up. There are all these little things that you can do to stay current, but I can almost guarantee you that if you keep doing the same thing over and over from day one to year number five and year number 10 and year number 20, you're not going to have the career longevity. So that's the difference between professional sports and the music industry is that it's not about your physical capability so much as your willingness to stay in touch with what is current and hip. And you can't blame the public and the industry for moving on. I hear this all the time from people. Ah, I hate what's on radio today. Um, okay, you might. You know what? Nobody's putting a gun to your head and telling you you've got to make music like that. But if you want to have music that's viable and that people are willing to pay money for, you kind of need to. But nobody's making you do that. Um, which music is best for building a career? songs or instrumentals? I get this question all the time. I've touched on it a little bit in the show today. Let's touch on it some more. Um, it really depends on you and who you are musically. Um, some people are just really adept at cranking out instrumental cues. They get it, they're good at it, they're fast at it, and their stuff gets used a lot. Other people don't have the kind of the natural proclivity to do that sort of stuff. They're songwriters. They're, they emote more. Lyrics are a big part of what they do. Um, as I mentioned earlier, songs are harder. So writing lyrics and getting vocals down and, and background vocals if necessary and mixing with vocals, all that stuff um, takes more time. So it, it can be rewarded with a bigger lump sum payment um, and it does get rewarded in, in the um, uh, performance royalties. Um, well, not so much anymore, actually. <laughs> um, vocal stuff and, and instrumental, I believe, uh, with all three of the PROs in the U.S., uh, certainly with ASCAP and BMI, I think now pay the same rate. Uh, again, there are variables that can affect these things, so don't hold me to that as an absolute across the board. But the bottom line is that 
a song will generally have a sync fee attached to it that is an upfront payment and you generally don't get that on instrumentals a lot of times um, instrumental cues are used uh, licensed for gratis which means no money up front so it's uh, you know I hate to use a, a time-worn cliche but uh, six and one half dozen of another um, I know people uh, here uh, there's a, a guy named Tim Myers that is one of the greatest examples of getting songs out there um, both for TV shows and TV commercials um, he, he was in one Republic and walked away from the band just as they were starting to blow up we've actually had him speak at the road rally and uh, rumor good rumor has it that he was cranking out a million bucks a year um, getting his stuff in TV commercials and, and TV shows doing primarily if not entirely songs um, I don't know that there are a lot of people that make a million bucks a year doing uh, instrumental cues uh, but then again if you're a song guy you might have a year where you make a million bucks or you might have two years or five years and then maybe your stuff falls out of fashion uh, maybe you don't stay all that current uh, I, I think it's easier to stay current doing instrumental cues and I think it's just an opinion of mine but I believe that doing instrumental cues is probably the easier, better path for creating the long-term, a long-term career. Uh, just an opinion on my part. Um, so I, I believe that instrumentals are a little better than songs, but you know what? You may not find it, if you're a song person at your core, you may not be all that rewarded by doing instrumental cues. Then again, who's to say your career couldn't be a hybrid of the two. Um, maybe you, you make a, a habit that, uh, you know, for every five cues that you do, you, you crank out a song. Find some sort of balance like that so you're feeding your artistic soul at the same time that you're laying a financial foundation. Um, just think that's something that could work for almost anybody. So there you go on that. What was what's the best music for building a career? Songs or instrumentals? It depends on you. It depends on your goals. It depends on the amount of time you can give it. Um, and maybe a hybrid is the answer. Um, okay. And this one. Uh, what are the most frequently requested genres of music for TV shows and films? Hold on. We need a drum roll for that one. Do I have a drum roll? Yes, if I turn it the right way. Drum roll. The most frequently requested genres of music for TV shows and films. Again, my opinion, but really educated opinion, is hip hop and EDM. And that's this year right now and for the last couple of years and maybe for the next couple of years although it could change in a heartbeat but it's just ridiculous you can tell just by looking at the taxi listings everybody wants hip-hop and everybody seems to want EDM why because those are probably the two biggest things out there in, in the the record market um, and film and TV music is reflective of what's going on in real life um, you know, it's yes, there are always other things. Could be they want 60s sounding folk, it could be that they want cocktail solo piano pieces. There are a lot of other things that get used frequently enough, but I don't think any genres of music are requested, certainly through taxi. And I hear this from friends of mine in the industry all the time as um, EDM and hip-hop it's just consistently those are the genres so gee should you feel all bummed out if you're an acoustic guitar playing singer songwriter not really um, can you translate what you do into hip-hop or EDM in any way shape or form gee maybe it scares the hell out of you I can't program a, a drum machine, you know, I, I, I don't know how to produce that kind of stuff. Well, that's the beauty of collaboration because you might be really good at melody, you might be really good at lyrics, you might be good at a lot of things that somebody who's great at producing beats isn't. And that's the beauty of coming together and collaborating. Um, 
figure out what your strengths are and figure out where the collaborators are the taxi forum and go in there and say hey this is what I do and what I do well and I'm looking for somebody else that can do this other thing and it'll take a little hunting and pecking a little uh, trial and error but eventually you will find people that uh, don't do what you do and that uh, the two of you come together and make beautiful music together. Um, Mary Band says, my best genres are uh, medieval and renaissance <laughs> with a big smiling face, maybe a laughing face after that. You know, um, sometimes it pays to be a specialist in, in, in a niche market. Um, I bet you there aren't a lot of people doing loop music out there. So it could be that, uh, you know, you're one of the few. And while they don't ask for that often, when they do, you rise to the top of the list. Um, okay, so let me take a swig of some regular water so I don't get too wired. And let me open it up now to Q&A for the rest of this. Um, I'm looking at the chat room for for those of you who are watching the show uh, on YouTube after the fact. When you see me doing this, it just means I'm looking at the chat room. Um, any questions, if you type the word QUESTION in all caps, it'll make it easier for me to see it as they scroll by. Um, Korean stuff gets requested a lot. That's because the next next Olympic Games are going to happen in Korea if the country's still there when the Olympics roll around. I don't know. Some days are worried about that. Um, Treble Tone says, not many people playing mountain dulcimers either. That's true, but hey, you don't get a lot of requests for that. Uh, and, and you know what? You... You could probably get a lot of attention from production music libraries by saying, I, you know, I play mountain dulcimers. And, and they may sign it because they don't have any of it, but it could sit there on the shelf for three and a half years or ten years waiting for the next request where it's going to come in. Um, okay, question from Danny Weber. If a sync fee is paid for an instrumental in a TV episode, is there a sync fee paid for subsequent, subsequent repeats of the same episode? Honestly, I've never thought about that. Um, I don't know. I'm sure somebody in the chat room will know. I know that sometimes for a TV commercial, um, oftentimes, maybe 100% of the time, if they license your music for a TV commercial for, let's say, a six-week run, um, and they license it again, you'll get paid that uh, sync fee up front. I don't know if it happens in a repeat or if, if that's just purely a performance royalty. So if anybody knows, that would be um, a great thing to put in the chat room. Um, Polly says, Michael says that EDM and hip hop are the two most requested genres. Yep, I say that with great authority. Um, Jim C says, might renew my membership uh, if more EDM comes out. I think we have a lot of EDM listings. Um, the guy who wrote the music for Seinfeld is rich because of all the repeats. That's true, but I don't think he gets a sync fee for those. It's all performance money. We've actually, I interviewed him um, can't remember his name right now. He, I know he moved. To, he just cashed in all his chips and moved to uh, South Carolina and built a compound for all of his family members. Um, Scott Hansen wants to know: Are harmonica players considered real musicians? Yes. You know why? Because I can play harmonica. Um, first run episodes pay more than repeats. That's true, but are, what about the sync fee question? I don't think that there are sync fees um, paid when something repeats. Um, uh, Mojo says sometimes there are sync fees paid for new markets. Um, I know that 
it, we used to get a ton of listings. It doesn't happen much anymore, but we used to get a ton, and I'm underlining that, putting it in bold caps, a ton of listings because back in the day when they licensed music for TV shows, they didn't anticipate that the shows were going to come out on DVD later on. So they had to renegotiate the deals and even something as little as an instrumental piece of music that was coming out, um, you know, let's say an episode of Dawson's Creek, and, and they did a whole seasons of Do season of Dawson's Creek on DVD, they would have to then go back to the people whose songs were used in the episode and renegotiate. And a lot of times, the people who own that music felt like they had the show's producers over a barrel, and they would ask for ridiculous sums of money, and the producers would then call Taxi and say, I need music, and we got a lot of taxi members and a lot of episodes of shows like Dawson's Creek when they went into the DVD market. I don't know how that works out now with like on-demand stuff. I'm not really sure, um, but we don't get a lot of requests for that. So I think that the, you know, the modern um, film and TV sync deals include the rights to um, include it for other forms of media, um, be it a DVD or some sort of streaming thing. Um, by the way, I know that some of you guys, I think Polly watches Billions last night's, uh, last week and last night's episodes, the TV show Billions on Showtime, incredible television, and I want to give a shout out to a music supervisor named Jim Black, who's the music supervisor on that show, some of the best music supervision you will see ever, really, really you know, like raising the bar for music supervisors by the work that Jim Black does on that show. Um, there were no, Mojo says, there were no DVD royalties. True story. Yep. Um, I'm scanning to see if there's another question in there somewhere. Um, Mitch Mash says, in advertising, they usually license the track for a period of time, six months to a year. So if they renew the commercial, you get to use the same music, you get paid again. That's absolutely true. And also, it's the geography is part of the, of the formula in that. Is it local, regional, or national? Um, we will write you a song that says, we'd love to get music on Billions. Man, I love that show. The, the storylines are so great. The writing is so great. The acting is just off the charts amazing. Um, and the music supervision, just incredible. Um, all right, no more questions. I may get out of here early tonight. <laughs> Scott Hansen wants to know what's the best way to hide royalty payments from your wife um, I don't know Scott oh man I wish I had a good answer for that um, it's tough because uh, you know every bank account gets associated with a uh, social security number and social security numbers are part of that uh, part of the PRO drill um, Somebody's asking, yeah. I gotta scroll up for this one. Uh, where did it go? I lost it. Um, anyway, uh, here's one from Flowers. Um, what about singers? Is there a future for those of us that want to sing on these playments? placements um yeah but it, it you know obviously if you're gonna have vocals you need somebody to sing those vocals um you know singing on commercials can be extremely lucrative um the days of jingles uh you know not a lot of people have jingles these days i won't say nobody or never but the number of jingles um is diminishing over time maybe they'll come back um, but I know people that have made a killing uh, singing jingles in their lifetime. Um, 
it can be great money. Uh, oops, gonna scroll it. Whoa. Joey asked a question. Everybody's saying that's a great question. I've lost it somewhere. Um, when you get a royalty payment and have to split it with your co-writer, how do you claim only half during tax season? Um, I, I think it just comes down to the dollars that hit your bank account. You know, it's just that simple. Um, I mean, if you, I don't believe, and again, I'm not an accountant, uh, nor am I a financial advisor, but I don't believe that you get the money. Um, you and your partner should both be on the copyright as co-writers and that you should both be registered with your PRO as well as the song. You know, you should both be signed up with the PRO. The song should be registered with the PRO. And that way the money actually comes, you know, through the funnel and then splits out to the two co-writers. Um, I think you're doing something wrong. If you're getting a check for $100 and then writing a check for $50 to your co-writer, I think you need to um, do it by by having both of you on uh, registered as writers. Um, beginner question. And so I'm glad that you're asking this because not everybody watching the show is experienced. Um, please define a sync fee. I'm so glad you asked that question. Thank you, Tasha. Uh, a sync fee is the upfront payment you get when your music is licensed for a TV show, a film, or a commercial. I'm sure there are other things that you get paid sync fees for, but those are the biggies and the most common. Um, so let's say that you get a song of yours is used in the show Billions. Um, and let's say that it's used as a background source piece of music. So two people get in a car and as they're driving, you hear music coming out, ostensibly coming out of the radio in the car. That means it's coming out of a source. It could be a jukebox in a club. It could be ambient music coming out of speakers in a ceiling in a restaurant or a hotel lobby. All those are considered source music cues. Um, they're certainly not featured. They're in the background somehow. And you typically, for a show that's going to be on a network or on HBO or Showtime, get somewhere in that $1,500 to $5,000 sync fee. That means an upfront payment. So if you are both the writer and still own 100% of the publishing on that, um, let's say you're lucky enough that you haven't uh, given up any of the publishing to a publisher, uh, and your next door neighbor's a music supervisor comes over for dinner and hears your song and says, I want to put your song in the TV show Billions. And you end up there and you get a check for $3,500. You would keep the whole $3,500. If, however, you got that song uh, picked up by a publisher or a production music library that gets music in films, TVs, and commercials, um, the publisher would typically get half the money. So of that $3,500, you'd get $1,750, and the publisher would get $1,750. On the back end, you get a performance royalty, which is money that's paid to you when your stuff is performed in a public arena. And by that, I mean um, broadcast on television, broadcast on radio. Could be that you get paid for music on hold. Uh, could I'm pointing at our telephone over there that you can't see. Um, could be that you get paid if uh, a, a band performs your song in concert uh, at the Staples Center. Um, could be that your song is played in a restaurant in, in the PA system as background music. All those things generate what's called a performance royalty and ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC are the performing rights organizations also known as PROs in America that collect that money and then distribute it out proportionally to the writers who should get it. So there's that. Um, well, 48 new messages. I'm scanning, I'm scanning. Uh, Sherry says she had a jingle company for many years in a regional market from 1982 to 1996 in Atlantic City. And it was so much fun. Um, why did you give that up, Sherry? She's a talented lady. Um, 
This is a great question from Dean Crepain. Is Taxi getting asked for any music for the emerging virtual reality and or augmented reality networks yet? Or is it too early in that technology's development? Um, the technology is really taking off. And I've got to say, um, I've just dipped my toe in the water as a consumer. Um, somebody on the staff, I, I've got a, uh, a Samsung S6 Edge that happens to snap into um, a uh, Samsung or Oculus, uh, whatever it is, you know, the, the goggles that you just take your phone, literally snap it in there. Virtual reality is awesome. <laughs> it's so much fun. You can tell it's a little early. Sometimes, a lot of times, things are still kind of grainy. Um, but it's come a long way in a very short amount of time. And uh, I, I read a lot about it and believe that it's going to be very much a part of our lives, um, as will voice commands versus typing something into a keyboard. Uh, I know a lot of us uh, have, um, uh, what do you call Alexa, <laughs> everybody's Alexa's just lit up. Um, Amazon, uh, what do they call them? Uh, I can't even think of the word. Anyway, um, voice, stuff that's done by voice is going to be a big deal. Uh, are people going to walk around wearing big old goggles you know, on their faces everywhere they go? I don't think so. Are they going to watch um, TV um, immersed in virtual reality? Uh, I, think the, I think video gamers will be the first giant market for that. Um, look, I, I know when we bought a new TV probably seven or eight years ago that it came with like four sets of um, 3D glasses. Uh, I think we used them one time and went, oh, that's cool. It looks better than 3D in the movie theater. Uh, but we've never used it again. So I, I think that while the technology is going to explode, um, I'm not sure what the arc is going to be on the adoption for that, Dean. But I think that, yes, um, virtual reality is, they're going to need music for it. Um, and ultimately, Taxi will get asked. We haven't had anybody ask us yet. I need another drink. My goodness, <clears throat> the questions are coming in kind of fast. Um, Anonymous4573 says, my mom owned the Jingle World, had more songs on radio than Michael Jackson at the time. That's cool. Um, Looking for another great question. Um, huh. I'm looking for a question <laughs> that's something that I should do. I hate to sit here silently, especially for the people that are watching after the fact. Um, Sherry says, uh, Michael, everyone started using radio songs or Sally Kellerman voiceovers. Uh, that, that's why her jingle business dried up. It's true. I used to run a studio in New York. I was the manager of a place called Howard Schwartz Recording for five and a half years before I moved to L.A., and we were probably the biggest um, studio, audio post-production studio for heavyweight TV commercials and uh, a lot of long-form TV, a lot of sports television um, got done at that place. And it, it's so, I mean, the voiceover business went from voiceover, people who uh, specifically did voiceovers, like a guy named Hal Douglas that did In a World you know, for movie trailers too. All of a sudden it was like Sophia Loren would come in. Um, just all, all these big actors were coming in doing voiceovers. And then we started doing stuff via satellite and eventually during, um, using ISDN lines so that you could get, you know, Sally Kellerman or some big actor um, to do a voiceover if you were a little production studio in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Um, so 
the voiceover guys uh, and ladies took a hit on that. And nowadays, they don't even need studios to do voiceovers. A lot of the voiceover actors work from their home just using the internet. Um, Tony Anderson says, thank you for taxing all the learning uh, resources. You're welcome, Tony. Thanks for watching the show. Um, trying to get caught up here. A lot of stuff. Uh, Tasha Parker Gibbs says, my confidence is growing. Taxi is a big motivator for me. Yay. You know what else is a motivator that we deliver to you? Our deadlines, targets and deadlines. Um, that's actually part of the Matt Vanderbilt ad. Uh, his secret weapons are targets and deadlines. I think those are secret weapons for a lot of our members. Um, all right, I'm scrolling down. Trying to get past uh, a lot of the stuff. Looking for questions. Type the word question in all caps. Um, it sounds like a lot of you guys are getting freezing chat rooms tonight or freezing screens. Uh, Jennifer Eight wants to know when was I at Howard Schwartz recording in New York? From 1982 to 1988. Um, did I record you, Jennifer? <laughs> I was a studio manager and I also did a lot of sessions there. Um, I, I was somebody who could do a, a music date, I could do a big jingle, I could do a voiceover, I could mix a picture. So uh, a lot of times we had guys who were like, you know, the best in the business that had big followings. Um, and if they went on vacation or got sick or something, I would cover for them. So it's pretty cool. I got to run this amazing facility. I think at the time we had six studios. And when I left there, we had, I want to say, eight or nine studios. Um, I mean, imagine that, a facility with like eight or nine rooms that went, I think our cheapest rate was 175 bucks an hour to record a voiceover to a piece of quarter-inch tape. And the rates went up to like 450 bucks an hour for mixing uh, to picture. Um, Tasha says, thank you for everything you do. You're welcome. Uh, we obviously, all of us here, I think, love what we do. Um, hey, Michael, is there uh, still a 6% success rate for taxi folks, or has it gone higher? You know, I want to address this issue, the 6% success rate. We actually, I think three years, probably in the like mid-90s up into the early 2000s, we would actually take all reports of success stories and then do the math. Um, it, it's much higher and here's why it's something that we didn't do back then because we just weren't even aware of it um, here's a great example somebody like Matthew Vanderbilt um, let's say he submits something for a taxi listing gets forwarded to that company the company says that's great Matt we love that piece of music what else do you have it's it's become commonplace now we hear this literally every day from members that, oh, you know, not only did I get that piece picked up, but they asked me what else I had, and I ended up signing 35 pieces to that library or uh, 113 pieces to another library. So, you know, we've never wanted to count stuff that we don't actually really truly know about. You know, we like to be able to say, look, there it is in writing, but it's gotten to the point where Okay, so if you get 113 pieces in eight, in one library and your music is in 10 different libraries and all this stuff either had its genesis um, from a, a forward from Taxi or from meeting a publisher at the Taxi Road Rally um, or collaborating with another member who was already connected with, with the publisher, all these things make up forwards um, and relationships and it's uncountable. It's unknowable. Not only is most of it not reported to us, but it's so like a geometric tree that branches out so far out into the universe anymore that we have no way to actually tabulate the stuff. All I can say with absolute certainty, certainty is that that 6% 6 number is a gross under-exaggeration. It's way past that. Way past that. And I'm really glad you asked that. Wow, 161 new messages. Um, uh, 
Michael, do you ever have a CPA come on a taxi show to answer questions about tax deductions for musicians? Um, we've had CPAs at the Taxi Road Rally that do breakout classes on that. I haven't had a CPA because, frankly, um, I think most people would find it kind of boring. <laughs> uh, by the way, uh, look, the tax deductions for musicians, again, I'm not a CPA or financial advisor. Uh, and I don't want to spend a lot of time in this because I've got 169 new questions. Now you guys are putting a lot of stuff in the chat room. But it's like pretty much like any other small business. The, uh, I believe this is true. The IRS wants to see that your income outweighs your expenses. If you're in the startup phase and you've dropped two or $3,000 on gear, you can't really write that off without raising an eyebrow at the IRS. But if you brought in $8,000 in revenue and you're writing off a couple thousand dollars for gear um, or deducting those as expenses, um, that's probably a legitimate deduction. But I'm not an accountant, so don't, don't take my word for it. But yeah, I, I don't think I've ever had a CPA on the show. You know, I may have had a guy named Alan Rosenthal on Taxi TV back in the early days of the show. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, Jennifer says, nice, one of your top 10 worked there from 1992 to 1997. Is that you, Jennifer? Um, I, I still keep in touch with Howie. Uh, he's like the, uh, he's like my older brother. Um, call me and just uh, tell whoever answers the phone here, say, hi, I'm Jennifer, I'm a taxi member, and Michael wanted me to call him. Um, I would love to share uh, Howie Schwartz stuff with you. I was actually there, um, the day after they closed Howie Schwartz and he was tagging everything for auction and I went there to give him a hug just to show him support because uh, the man changed my life. Um, question, what's the turnaround time between the taxi deadline and the time the music is screened and forwarded? That's a great question. Um, we build the timeline in there because uh, and there, there are no two that are really exactly alike, but we know that if it's a singer-songwriter listing looking for, you know, stripped-down acoustic singer-songwriter stuff, we can pretty much anticipate that we're going to get, you know, 150, 200, 300 submissions for that. Um, if somebody's asking for dulcimer music, we might only get six submissions for that. So we know that we build in a little timeline after the fact. So. If uh, the deadline that you see, let's say, is May 15th, that means that we probably, for something that's not going to get a lot of submissions, we probably build in a two to five day window after the fact. Sometimes, you know, if the deadline is May 15th, we will get the stuff in somebody's hands on May 16th. Um, the listing will usually say that it's urgent or it will be a taxi dispatch listing. But it, there's really an art form to the whole um, balance of, of how stuff gets screened, when it gets screened, who screens it, their availability, um, the speed at which a certain type of music gets screened versus another. Um, there is a lot of art and a lot of science that get blended together to make taxi work. And usually when people come to work here, they're like, holy crap, who knew? <laughs> it's, it's the back end of what goes on here that you guys never see is really complex. Um, question audio painter wants to know was wondering what happens to taxi when i retire um honestly i don't know i think about it a lot um in my early 60s i'm not going to work here forever um i would hope that uh, i can sell the company to somebody that wants to carry the torch with a lot of passion and a lot of integrity um <laughs> mary ben says oh no michael can't retire unless hannah takes over Hannah doesn't even live in America anymore. <laughs> um, uh, Mojo says that there's video of Chuck Schlachter's panel from the 2011 Road Rally. I think it might have been more recently than 2011. I think it was like 2014. I could be wrong about that, but I think I'm right. Um, uh, Chuck Schlachter is a longtime taxi member who's a very smart, very good man who is a certified financial planner and a financial professional. We purposely, uh, we've never been able to publish the text, the transcript of that panel because there are a lot of rules for financial advisors. Um, 
so we couldn't publish that if somebody shot a video of it and put it out there on their own yay um, I couldn't do it um, Tony Anderson says I love this taxi family uh, taxi is family um, I'm looking for other questions. Um, Vicki, hi Vicki, how are you? Uh, Vicki says that she gets her returns faster these days, sometimes just a couple of days instead of a month. Yeah, that's something that um, the staff is doing a really, really good job on. Uh, Laura is really responsible for that. And uh, it was something that had gotten a little sloppy over time. And, and trust me, it takes a tremendous amount of effort to get this stuff turned around quickly and get it turned around well because it goes through several steps that you guys don't even know about here in the office um, before we can click the button that says okay let everybody know if they were forwarded or returned um, before we can get the music out to the industry people they're just so there's like seven steps that happen um, I don't want to bore you guys with it but uh, I would say that Laura and her team d deserve a lot of credit for uh, getting that stuff turned around much faster than it's probably ever been in the company's history. Um, Marcus says, we appreciate you, Michael. Thank you, Marcus. I appreciate you guys being, uh, like I always say, I don't think of you guys as customers so much as, as friends that give me money. Hey, <laughs> best kind of friends ever. Um, anyway, I, I hope we earn every penny of that because we sure work hard at it. Um, that's right. Vicky says, can't have a CPA and taxi TV because they can't speak to the situation in other countries. Uh, that's true. Or even other states, you know, uh, state tax rules affect a lot of stuff. Um, looking for other questions. I, God, there's some 232 things in, in the chat room now. And I thought this show was going to be short. Uh, looking for anybody that's typed the word question in all caps uh, Dap Junior 45 says Michael I really appreciate everything you do for us you uh, tell me who shares this info every week nonstop the Lord blesses people that blesses others thank you um, I love what I do I'm passionate about it. Uh, it it some weeks really takes a lot out of me I, I spent I don't know, probably three hours yesterday on a Sunday working on getting ready for Taxi TV. Um, Kano says Taxi will live forever. I hope so. Um, I don't think I'm going to live forever. <laughs> uh, what's required? This is a good question. What's required to license cover songs? And I, I think that uh, what Dell and Jen means is if you. Let, let's say I'm a musician um, and I do a cover version, probably today's market, a reimagined version, cover version of a song. In other words, taking something, you know, like a popular song that was a slow version and making it a pop punk version um, or taking something that was a, a fast rock song and making it like a slow, dreamy ballad thing that might be good for a movie trailer. Basically, the only thing you really own in that situation is your master recording. Um, so the person who licenses, let's say for a trailer um, or a TV commercial or, or a TV show for that matter, they're going to have to license the composition from the publishing company um, that controls the composition and they're going to license the master from you. Um, sometimes uh, there's a favored nations clause that says, that the person who has the rights to the master gets paid the same thing that the copyright holder gets paid. Um, if it's you and the Rolling Stones, probably not going to have a favored nations clause in there. Um, scrolling down, looking for another one. How many screeners are there and could we ever see a picture of the room? Sure. Uh, we used to actually have a camera up in the ceiling looking down on the screeners, but some of the screeners didn't like that, um, and, and they would wear baseball hats to work. Apparently, they had ex-wives or the mafia after them or something. Um, I would say that in any given month, there are between 
30 and 50 screeners that are active. Um, frankly, the room sits largely empty, which is depressing. We've got 14 workstations sitting in a room, which of course is right in the middle. We've got about 4,500 square feet of space in a taxi office. The screener room sits right in the middle. And it sits there empty because so many of our screeners have left Los Angeles because California is just so expensive to live in. We've had screeners move to Australia, screeners years ago, we had somebody that moved to Alaska, um, screeners that moved to Central California, to Nevada. And so many of them are working remotely now that the screening room is like, it's like weird and eerie. I walk through there and there's nobody in there and the lights are turned off. I find it kind of depressing, frankly, and we're trying to force people to come back and screen, at least the local people that live within a reasonable drive, which in LA is tough to have, um, to get this, to some life back in that room because I can't really let go of the real estate because it's right in the middle of the office. To consolidate the space would require a, a, some construction and a lot of moving of stuff. So we're trying to figure that out. Um, uh, I see some Mojo talking about the Complete Guide to Music Publishing by Steve Winogratsky. Um, Winogratsky is an old friend of mine. Um, he's recently retired from um, practicing law, but we've had him on panels at the Road Rally. He's been on Taxi TV. He is a super, I mean, just about as nice a person, as knowledgeable as you could possibly want. Yes, any book that he writes, you should read. Um, Let's see. Uh, ah, Songmaster says, thank you, Michael, for Taxi. I'm retired and got my first placement because of Taxi. I hope you send an email to memberservices at taxi.com or deals at taxi. Send it to memberservices at taxi.com. We love to put that stuff in the newsletter. Uh, <laughs> we love you, Uncle Michael. <laughs> uh, Randall Wixon's Plain and Simple Guide to Music Publishing is also indispensable. Absolutely. Um, Amanda says, I wouldn't be working full-time as a lyricist if it wasn't for Taxi and Michael. Thank you, you guys. Oh, boy, what is it? Love, love Michael and Taxi Day? Um, question. This was answered by the cool chat room, uh, but I want to hear him say it. Uh, what are standard cue lengths? Um, frankly, there really isn't a standard cue length. It's not like people say, I need a cue that's exactly 90 seconds long, or I need a cue that's exactly 60 seconds long. They might on occasion, you know, like uh, for a commercial, they want stuff that's 29 and a half seconds long, but a lot of times they'll take a song that could be a four minute song and edit it down to 29 and a half. Um, typical cue lengths for instrumental cues for, um, production music libraries, I would say 60 seconds is a minimum, although I do know people that have produced cues that have been 30 seconds. But just from a practical, pragmatic perspective, 60 seconds would be a minimum. Um, 90 seconds is probably kind of in the middle and recommended. Two minutes is not unheard of. Three minutes is not unheard of, but you're pushing it a little bit. Four or five minutes is getting to be too long. And that's no longer a cue, by the way. That's more, uh, there's a difference between an instrumental and an instrumental cue. A cue has its own arc. A cue um, is, is something that has primarily an A section. It's kind of like the chorus lasts through the whole thing, but it builds. Um, and then um, uh, <laughs> there's sometimes a B section, which is kind of like a bridge, and then it goes back to the A section, and it builds up again, and then finishes with a buttoned or stinger ending. Um, an instrumental might be more akin to something that's like a full-length song, but without a vocal, and because the vocal melody is gone, maybe there's some other instrument that fills in the melody, but I wouldn't fill in the melody with every note that the vocal used to do, because if you do that, it ends up sounding like a Monovani record or 101 strings or Muzak or something. Um, but to just submit something that, you know, where you just mute the vocal track is going to sound more like a rhythm track. So drop in some sort of what I call melody light. Um, All right, uh, we are now four minutes over time, so I'm going to end this in a couple of minutes. And I, there are 275 messages. Um, Sherry says she's going to live forever. She'd be happy to take over if Michael wants to rest. <laughs> Michael would like to rest. I just figured out last night, I don't know why I was on I haven't taken a vacation in about 14 months, and I would like a little vacation. Um, 
screener cam. Yeah, we had a screener cam for years. Um, I want a tour of Taxi. Um, we've done tours of Taxi before. The staff gets really cranky when I do that. I don't know why, but they do. Um, maybe they forgot to shower that morning or put on makeup or something. I don't know. But yeah, I can do a tour. Um, how do people become a screener at Taxi? You've got to have a very, very credible resume. As a matter of fact, if you go to our website, taxi.com, um, oh no, it doesn't tell what the requirements are to be a screener, but on taxi.com, there's a thing in the top menu navigation uh, near the top of the page that says need music and click on that and you can see the requirements um, that we have for people that run listings with Taxi. But to be a screener at Taxi, you have to have been an a and r person at a legit label um, or a publisher um, working at a real publishing company that's you know had some um, verifiable success um, we've had a few people that have been music journalists but music journalists uh, at a very high level like guys that have written consistently for like rolling stone kind of that level um, Let's see, what else? Uh, we've had music supervisors. We still, to this day, have people who are music supervisors. Look, music supervisors, generally speaking, um, their, their, their work is kind of like hills, peaks and valleys, you know, where they're busy as can be for like six months and then have a month with nothing going on and they sit around complaining, oh my, am I ever going to work again? It's kind of like actors. Uh, and, and then they get busy again. So peaks and valleys, and a lot of times when they're in a valley, um, but they know that they've got a show that's firing back up, let's say late summer for um, the fall season, some of the music supervisors will actually run listings with this and come in and screen their own stuff because they're building a stash of music for the fall season. It happens. Um, try and think of other circumstances music coordinators we've had music coordinators uh, who are very you know frankly a lot of times music coordinators are really the people who are on the front lines of getting music on the TV shows yes the supervisor um, kind of sets the course which it trickles down from the executive producer to the music supervisor the coordinator is the one in the trenches getting his or her hands dirty the supervisor then picks the stuff uh, ultimately and then presents it to the executive producer to see if it stays or goes um, so basically you have to have a really good resume and frankly we found over the years we've had people that have been screeners at taxi who have been vice presidents of A&R at major entities like Sony or Universal and sometimes they're not the best screeners they may have great ears but they don't have great communication skills sometimes um, we have people that have great communication skills, but their resumes might not be as impressive. You know, like somebody who's a music coordinator, they're kind of a little bit low on the, the, the food chain there, but they are in it. They're in the trenches every day. And, and frankly, sometimes they're better than people higher up in the food chain. So it really comes down to us giving them a try. First of all, they've got to have a credible resume. Second of all, they come in here and we look at their work. I mean, we monitor everything they do, certainly in the initial stage. And then we've got two people, um, uh, John Weiss, um, who is himself a music supervisor that's done, I think, hundreds of episodes of the Kardashians and Road Rules Challenge, or not Road Rules Challenge, but The Challenge. Um, um, he did, uh, when I first met him, he was doing Max Bigford, uh, Bix, Bigford on CBS. And um, John has been in and out of here several times over the years um, and is currently um, kind of like sharing the duties, head screener duties with a guy named Tom Stillwagon, who's amazingly good at his job. And they check everything. They're, they're constantly monitoring the screeners to make sure that they're not doing anything stupid. Um, one thing that we watch for is copying and pasting. We've had screeners that have been fired, frankly, um, and we catch them pretty quickly. Uh, we have been somebody who was writing the same thing over and over on every critique back when we did them with pencil and paper, if you can believe that. Um, sometimes it looks like they're, they're 
copying and pasting when they're actually not because there are really only so many ways you can say your chorus needs to be bigger or you need more contrast or your your lyric is meandering or your mel melody is meandering or your lyric doesn't make sense. It, it becomes very apparent very quickly when you're a taxi screener that you need to expand your um, your arsenal or your quiver of arrows in the way that you say the same things over and over. Holy smokes, there are 326 new messages. I'm going to feel really bad when I end the show today. Um, all right, I'm going to do like three more questions. Uh, what's the screener training like? Um, it's tough. Um, I don't know, you know, we don't train them how to be good judges of music. They come to us and have to prove to us that they are. The training is more in how they communicate to you guys. Um, Robin Frederick has done that for a number of years. Even though she doesn't work here full time anymore, we still bring Robin back because she's just so good at talking about music and teaching other people to talk about music. And she does her courses where we'll get like four or five, six different screeners, throw them in the conference room with Robin, and she will sit there for 90 minutes and play music and say, okay, how would you say this? How would you say that? How would you approach this? So we don't train them how to judge music. They've got that skill under their belt when they come through the door. It's all about uh, teaching them a lot of times people in the industry don't have to speak intelligently to somebody about why something doesn't work. It's really easy when you're the vice president of Sony to say, doesn't float my boat, doesn't work for that artist, or if you're a music supervisor, nope, that won't work in this show. But the member in Peoria needs to know why it won't work. Now, we can't tell them why it won't work with picture in that show because the member won't see the picture. You can't release that to the public before the show airs because you just can't. Um, but the screeners need to be able to say, you know, uh, the chorus wasn't big enough because you didn't change up your rhythmic pattern. You didn't add extra layers of instrumentation. You didn't do a lift coming into the chorus that made it more explosive. Those are the types of things that we need to make sure that these people, they know it. They, they can internalize it. Whether or not they can puke it back out to the members effectively is the issue. So that's what we train them uh, to do. Um, is there a link somewhere about the whole screener thing? Um, there, there's a link that will show you a relatively current list of screeners. I mean, some of the, some of the people that are on there, you know, they come and go. Uh, we generally don't take them off the list unless we know they're never coming back here. But sometimes you know, we could have a screener that goes out on a tour for nine months with a, a major act and um, you know, their, their job has been their record producer. Um, and they're a well-known producer with real credits, but they also happen to play keyboards for a really big artist. Um, I've got a friend right now who is the guitarist on uh, Enrique, Enrique Iglesias' tour, but he is also you know, a great producer, great engineer, um, and would absolutely be qualified to be a screener here at Taxi. Um, but he just left on last Monday, a week ago, to go out on tour, and he won't be back until like July or August. So if he were a screener here, you know, he'd be on the list of screeners, but not active. So that's why I say the 30 to 50 active ones in any given month. Um, Kano says the placements are rolling in snowball style. Um, <laughs> Sherry thought I, it was freezing. It's me reading the chat. Um, Wow, I'm so far behind. There are 368 things. Uh, question. I have a few hundred 60 and 30 second tracks from jingles in many genres. Most posts ask for longer time. Suggestions for placements? Yeah. Um, edit. You know, can you edit some of those and, and make them into longer pieces? Um, Q 
can, a question from Sasha. Can we have another episode of Taxi TV where you play music and we suggest where the songs can be placed uh, or pitched? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know what else we haven't done in a while is one of those episodes where we play um, forwards and returns for a particular listing. I just realized it's 544. 44. Um, the show's been going on now for an hour and 45 minutes. <clears throat> I'm hoarse, and I've got to wrap it up because I've got to do some tagging and stuff th to get the episode to uh, Bria, who then puts it up on YouTube. So, guys, as much as I feel terrible that there are 374 new things um, in the room, I can't hang out and, and do any more. i got to go. So thank you so much for watching. Um, in pencil on next week's agenda is Rob Shirelli. He's been super, super, super busy. Now that he's a double Grammy winner, um, my friend Rob Shirelli, who is an engineer, mixer, producer, and has just blown up in the gospel world. I mean, this is a guy that has done like eight records with Will Smith, worked with, um, oh gosh, uh, Leanne Rimes, Madonna, um, Ray, Ray Charles, I mean, just about Stevie Wonder, all these incredible acts. Lately, his thing for the last couple of years has been gospel. He's doing like all the big gospel records and he's busy as can be, but he wants to do the show. He had me write him in for next week. So if Rob can make it, we'll do that. If not, maybe I'll do one of those uh, forward and return shows. And yes, Katy Perry was a screener here. She did gospel, believe it or not. We didn't even know she could do pop when she came here. She's pretty low key. Um, all right, you guys, thank you for watching. I will see you next week for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live, baby. Live!